Hi, everybody. Welcome to the chat box. I'm David Cruz. Our segment last week on immigration proved to be our most watched. The issue is front and center in the early days of the Biden administration. The president issued some new executive orders this week, and we'll talk about that today with Senator Bob Menendez. But we begin today with the first lady of the state of New Jersey, Tammy Murphy. Madam First Lady, good to see you again. Good to see you too, David. Thanks for having me. So when we first met on television, what seemed like a million years ago, you were just getting started in your role as First Lady, and we were talking about what your, pro, uh, your portfolio was going to look like. I imagine that responding to a global pandemic was not in that portfolio. No, I have to say that was, that was not on my radar screen at that point in time. You're correct. So, I mean, have these three years zoomed by or has it felt a little bit like time is standing still? Um, I would say probably some of each. Uh, you know, I, I feel like there's so much to do. The days are really full. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a great feeling when you're able to see a problem and try and help fix it. So I would say it's, 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 it's been great. But there's a lot to do. So humbled to be able to be in this position to help. The governor says COVID is almost everything that he does all day. Has it, has it changed what you do as First Lady? Or, or should I say, how much has it, has it changed what you do as First Lady? Uh, absolutely, it has changed what I do. Um, you know, just it's, it's hard. You know, you think back to when this started. It's been almost a year now. And I would say as First Lady, a lot of the things that I was doing obviously had to go virtual. Um, many of the things that we were working on through Nurture, Nurture NJ became Facebook Live events as opposed to becoming you know, family festivals that we did in person. Uh, and, and in recent weeks, uh, I've been going around the state trying to visit with different vaccination centers to put a spotlight on the types of places where one can get the vaccination and to you know, talk to those and give support to the people who are on the ground. And, and um, that's, been, that's been really rewarding. We have an incredibly, um, really strong infrastructure that's been set up. And as and when we have all the vaccines we need, then we are gonna be off to the races. Yeah, we see you here with uh, a lot of folks at these vaccine sites. I mean, it's a heavy load though. You, you, are, you must feel a sense of responsibility for all of this, how things are going, people's tragedies, all of those things uh, are part of your everyday life right now. They are, they are. I mean, I hear, you know, I hear from people all the time who need help in some way. And I'd say increasingly as time has gone by, um, there's more and more outreach asking me if I can help connect people or help give them advice in some way, shape or form. Um, but you know, we're all in this together. And, you know, here and now, um, Phil and I haven't gotten this vaccine yet. We would love to get it when we, when our turn is up, we will be front and center to, to do so. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's, it's a responsibility, but it's also a real honor to be able to meet with the incredible people the, the pictures that I just saw you show were from a mega site down in Atlantic city. Uh, you know, we have six of those around the state right now, and each of those are able to um, vaccinate 2,400 people, uh, give 2,400 vaccinations a day, which is really incredible. Um, so, you know, we, we, we've got, we've got, you know, between the Office of Emergency Management, the Department of Health, um, the individual counties and hospital systems, we, we, we have all hands on deck right now. Oh, that's, that's, uh, that's actually at a testing site I'm seeing right there. Um, that was at an, another moment in time. Yeah. So much of it, right? I mean, the testing, uh, was the thing that you needed to get up to speed so that we knew where we were with this pandemic. And then now that the vaccines uh, have been made available, it's you see the end of it, but it's so tough because, as you said, you know, we need to get the vaccine and there's not enough of that stuff around for people. So, the, the you know, it's like you have this anticipation, but then you're kind of frustrated by the, you know, inevitable bureaucracy of everything, right? Well, I suppose, I, I mean, I, you know, it, it, now that we have a national strategy to actually tackle this, I think we are in a much better place um, because having partners at the federal level who are really focused on what's going on here in the States and helping us not only get the access to the vaccine, but uh, actually, you know, so deliver the vaccine, 
help help inoculate kids, actually give the vaccines, and then also just helping us with um, infrastructure and more. Um, it's it, that is really a kick in our step. I will say we have actually, I think, as of today, we are um, we are at over eight. We're like eight hundred seventy or eight hundred eighty thousand vaccines have been given in our state, which is really fantastic. But we need to do more. So I know you wanted to talk about your Nurture and J program, but let's start with the announcement this week launching the state's action plan to prevent and reduce child <laughs> adversity. Uh, tell us about that. Adverse um, sure, childhood well, experiences. Adverse childhood experiences, exactly. So that was announced today. Um, there is a, they've been working on this plan for, I guess, two years now. Um, you know, essentially the plan is is helping to provide trauma and uh, um, make us a trauma-informed state such that there are trauma is like every piece of healthcare and it's 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 brought to the level of consciousness across our entire state um, obviously the disparities that exist in in terms of those who are impacted by adverse childhood experiences um, are also the same disparities that exist uh, in nurture New Jersey which is my statewide plan and in fact uh, the implementation of the action plan that was announced today is also part of uh, Nurture New Jersey's plan as well. We are really hand in glove working together. And at the end of the day, uh, the, the announcement today is essentially um, helping to create healthy girls who become healthy women, who become healthy pregnant women and healthy mothers. And it's a cycle that we need to stop um, and, and make sure that we are providing the best level of care across our, across our state. I mean, you, you uh, talk about uh, the, the program. I mean, a, a black mom, seven times more likely uh, than a white mom to die from maternity-related complications. A black baby, three times more likely than a white baby to die before their first birthday. As you said, people should be shocked by this, but it's the kind of statistic that's been laid bare to the public at large by this pandemic, right? Which has exposed health care disparities that have existed for generations, right? Absolutely. I mean, you could take a, even a bigger picture look at this, David. The United States is 55th in the world in terms of maternal mortalities. And then within the United States, New Jersey is 47th. And you just you just uh, shared some of the statistics on in New Jersey about black women and white women and black babies and white babies. This is 2021. We are New Jersey. We are, you know, in some respects, the medicine cabinet of America, and we have an incredible healthcare system. So this is unacceptable. And the Nurture New Jersey plan is, our plan is to make New Jersey the safest place in the United States, not only to deliver a baby, but to raise a child. And that's what we're going to do. I remember that initial interview we had, it was in January. I don't think you, you've been sworn in yet, or the, you know, the governor hadn't been sworn in yet. And you thought that the environment would be the biggest thing that you would be working on. But now your focus clearly is on families and vulnerable families specifically. But you still dabble in some wind and solar and, and environmental <laughs> justice, don't you? I do. In fact, I'm really happy to tell you that uh, we've been working uh, for the last um, several years on together with the Department of Ed and helping to make New Jersey the first state in the country that actually will teach climate change in our K-12 curriculum. So I'm really proud of that. Um, that's an opportunity for our children to learn the, tech, the, the terminology, the vocabulary, and to be able to think out of the box as we move forward and we really embrace the green energy economy. We are going to be completely green in New Jersey by the year 2050. There's going to be incredible jobs that come alongside that. Um, but the climate is changing and we need to make sure that our children are equipped for the future and know how they can not only fill the many roles that are going to be needed in the new economy, but also are able to think through um, constructively as to how they can tackle some of the some of the challenges that they're going to be faced with. You're watching Chatbox. I'm David Cruz. First Lady Tammy Murphy is with us. We should note that it was almost a year ago that Mr. Murph, I don't know if you call him that, I know he calls you Mrs. Merv. Uh, and it was almost, it was about a year ago that uh, the governor had a, a serious operation on his kidney. How's he doing? And, and do you have any time to even think about personal health? Um, first of all, he's doing great. 
Um, so we are, we're really fortunate because, you know, one thing we didn't even know about at the time, I guess he had that surgery on March 4th and that was the day that we had the first case here in New Jersey. Yeah. So we found out after he had the surgery that had that been scheduled for one week later that he would not have been able to have that surgery because it would have been considered elective surgery. I think we all think about elective surgery as being kind of, you know, uh, getting a nose job or something. And when in fact, elective surgery encompasses a lot of different um, surgeries. So anyway, he's doing great. Thanks for asking. And the kids are mostly home or not? How's that going? Well, I would say that the silver lining of the entire pandemic was that uh, for us, for our, for our family, is that we had all four of our children home for a, a, a long period of time, um, which we was completely unexpected. Oh, yes. Uh, and uh, sadly now, or I guess positively, if you're looking at it, they are moving on with their lives. And, you know, two of them are back in their um, college communities as, as we speak. Um, and uh, the others are, they're all doing their own thing. So they're they're now starting to spread their wings again and, and in a safe manner, I hope. Uh, we're all going back about our business and moving forward. So re-election mode now. You showed <laughs> some real restraint over the summer in Middletown when those women were harassing the family at dinner. And, and I saw your face. Uh, you held it together, though. Uh, I ask because it's going to be a rough and tumble uh, next 10 months as you head into re-election. Did you... Learn something from 2017 that uh, taught you anything about patience, strategy, pacing yourself? You know, uh, Phil and I are like, we just keep going. Just we are, we are energizer bunnies, I guess. We just focus on something and that's where we go. But I would tell you if I, if I learned anything and it's something that I will accept and admit up front, and that is that uh, Phil always says, I can't play poker. I am not the kind of person who um, is able to to say one thing and feel something else. I, I it's written all over my face. So uh, I say to you that um, you know I, I I feel really strongly about what we've been able to do so far, what Phil's been able to do, and I'm really happy that you know he's able right now to just focus fully on the state. As for me, I, I try and do whatever I can to compliment and, and support him and make sure that he is as, as effective um, as he can be as he tries to get us through COVID right now and get us to the other side of where we are. All right, singularly focused, First Lady Tammy Murphy. Good to see you again. Thanks for coming on with us. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me. We got a big response to our segment last week on immigration reform and its potential impact on the state. We're going to pick up on that today with the man who's asked to uh, carry a lot of the weight on the immigration reform agenda, New Jersey's senior senator, Bob Menendez. Senator, welcome back to the show. Great to be with you, David. So let's start with the immigration bill itself, a goal of 11 million people out of the shadows and onto a pathway to citizenship, green cards immediately for some with, uh, within just a few years for most folks family-focused immigration. There's a lot in there, and there's already talk that it might be too much for this Senate to pass. Is it likely to be broken up into pieces, do you think? Well, David, uh, President Biden's uh, immigration plan, which I have put into legislation and refined, is the vision of where we ultimately want to go as it relates to immigration reform. But that vision is also driving us to uh, what we can achieve. And I think we can achieve a fair amount of it robustly. Remember that uh, in the last Congress, the House of Representatives passed the American Dream and Promise Act, which was a dreamers, TPS, temporary protective status holders. They passed a farm workers bill and they did it with bipartisan votes. Uh, I believe that uh, there is an opportunity not only to see that, but I hope some essential worker provisions. And then with that coming from the House to the Senate and with an administration using political capital uh, with some of our Republican colleagues, uh, I believe that we can get a rather robust uh, immigration reform. So that's what we're working hard to try to achieve. We've heard a lot about this gang of eight, that group of senators who tried something similar back in 2013 before they fell short. But that kind of bipartisanship seems to be so 2013 and not very 2021. 
I mean, Senators Lindsey Graham and, and Marco Rubio were part of that gang of eight, and they've come out against most of this bill. You believe that there's an environment there where you can uh, drum up some bipartisanship? Well, I was part of that gang of eight in 2013. And uh, the reality is uh, several members of the Republican uh, caucus who are still here uh, may not have been part of the original gang, but joined us in votes when we got 67 votes in the United States Senate to send bipartisan comprehensive reform to the House of Representatives, which unfortunately, uh, Speaker Boehner and the Republican controlled House at the time never gave us a vote. So I believe there is a foundation. For example, many of my Republican colleagues come from ag states. They concerned deeply about uh, the farm workers uh, provision of these immigration reforms. Many of them come from other industries that need uh, HB visa uh, individuals. Um, some of them come from high tech industries that want to see uh, us use the provision of the legislation that I'm sponsoring that would take someone who graduates from one of our great colleges or universities and use their abilities in STEM uh, to produce American products and create jobs. So that's how I'm looking to create a, a coalition. And uh, we will judge as we go along whether the coalition is big enough for the total comprehensive bill or whether there will be segments of it, as long as we get to significant reform, a robust reform, then um, I'm uh, you know, willing to pursue what it takes to get to 60 votes. You use words like significant and, and robust. What to you, and I guess I don't want you to, to show your cards right now, but what to you needs to be in there? What's a, a non-starter to take out? Well, you know, I've learned over my years, uh, 29 years in Congress, uh, not to start saying, well, this is the red line. Red lines uh, never are, are very successful. Uh, but I will judge it as we go along. So will the uh, activists in the community. So will the business community. The business community, U.S. Chamber of Commerce and others, are very much engaged in wanting to see reform. I, I welcome their support in this process. Uh, the, the agricultural industry, very interested in reform. Uh, let's remember who these people are. These are the people who, in the midst of the pandemic, were doing the essential work so that we could stay home and be safe. These are the people who were delivering goods to our doors. These were people who were producing the food supply. Uh, you know, uh, these are the people who create the crops uh, so, uh, and harvest them from the field. So the bottom line is, is that when we look at all of those different elements of our economic question, forgetting about the moral question or what's right, economically, last time I made this case, uh, the Congressional Budget Office, uh, scored uh, the last reform. I think the score will be even better this time, where the economy grew, the GDP grew dramatically, the wages of all Americans rose. We added several hundred million dollars to the Social Security Trust Fund to make it more solvent as a result of people paying in. Uh, and we reduced the national debt uh, by billions of dollars as a result of the participation of this universe. So I think those are compelling arguments to make, even to the most fiscally conservative members of our our Republican colleagues. And there also has been a new appreciation uh, uh, and definition of what an essential worker is. I mean, you know, a, a lot of us who may interact daily at grocery stores and, and places like that, you see those folks, but they're really kind of so underappreciated that they're invisible in many ways. But the pandemic has really laid bare how essential these people are, no? Absolutely. Yeah. They, they were the ones risking their health and their lives so that all of us, uh, particularly at the height of the pandemic, even though we're still challenged by the pandemic, when the orders say stay home, uh, we could stay home because they were making the deliveries. They were still uh, at the supermarkets and at the grocery stores. They were still at the meat packing plants. They were still at the poultry plants. They were still ultimately uh, doing the work of harvesting crop so that we could all uh, be nourished. And so, uh, you know, what we took for granted, I've never taken it for granted, but when I say we, the American people take for granted, was very vivid as to how essential these people are and why they deserve simply a pathway to earn their way 
uh, towards permanent residency, pay their taxes, go through a criminal background check, and be part of American society. There is a sense also, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that uh, Republicans are prepared to make the DACA program, for instance, uh, permanent and, and kind of codify that so that it's not subject to the whim of presidential uh, philosophical ups and downs. Uh, well, uh, on this one, Senator Graham, who was part of the, uh, the Gang of Eight, has uh, joined with Senator Durbin, who is now the chairman of the Judiciary Committee in the Senate, uh, to introduce a Dreamers resolution, uh, uh, legislation, which would give them a pathway, an accelerated pathway towards permanent residency and status in the country. These are young people who have served the, in the uniform of the United States. These are young people who are some of the most incredibly gifted individuals, valedictorian, salutarians of their universities that they've graduated from. Uh, they only know one national anthem, that of the United States. Uh, they know uh, only uh, one pledge of allegiance to one flag, that of the United States. They are American in every other uh, element of their lives except for their status. And so uh, that's the motherhood and apple pie of immigration reform. If we can't get that, then I doubt we could get much else. But we need to do more than just dreamers. These executive orders uh, signed this week, what are, they what are they intended to deal with? The executive orders that uh, uh, President Biden signed is uh, one, to restore our, our place in the world as it relates to a asylum for refugees, but under an orderly and legal process so that people who have a legitimate asylum claim, they fear for their lives or persecution, religiously or otherwise, will have the opportunity to make their case. It is to guarantee and create a special task force so that the 600 or so children who were torn away from their mother's uh, and father's arms at the border and have not been uh, re, uh, reunited with their parents that that immediately has to be the first uh, job of Secretary Mayorkas, the new Secretary of Homeland Security. It's about uh, changing uh, some of the harsh uh, policies, uh, cruel, I would say, that the previous administration had, which ultimately didn't result in a better immigration situation. Some are expressing concern that there's a lot of reviewing, but not a lot of uh, outright canceling uh, of things like the Remain in Mexico program, where asylum seekers have to wait outside of the U.S. while the claims are being processed in immigration courts. What can you say to reassure immigrants of all statuses that this is an administration that is not only going to not be Trump, but will actually accomplish significant reform? Well, look, uh, the, the bottom line is I think uh, we have a president who in the first week in office sent a comprehensive immigration outline to the Congress. We have a president who used his pen to reestablish ourselves as a nation of immigrants and to make uh, more secure and more humane our immigration process. And actually, one of his or uh, orders is with reference to the Remain in Mexico policy. So I would say, let's just realize that we cannot undo four years in one or two weeks. It's the beginning of a process. I look forward to the successful uh, and robust uh, achievement of what we want to see in terms of comprehensive reform. You were one of this group of senators who met with the president about the COVID re recovery package. You're not going to get a lot of uh, Republican support, if any at all. The president urged Congress to act now and to go big. You're on board with that, even if it means going the, the kind of roundabout way that you're going to do. Well, I, when I met with President Biden and other colleagues at the White House yesterday, it, it was clear uh, that he wants a big and robust package because a national emergency requires a national response. And I agree with him. Uh, I was here during the last Great Recession uh, as a member of the Senate Finance and Banking Committee. So our failure to robustly respond then led to a prolonged and protracted uh, economic recovery that left a lot of Americans behind, a lot of New Jerseyans be behind, and where many lost their homes. We should learn from that lesson, not repeat it. And while we want bipartisanship, uh, I remind my Republican colleagues, 
that they ran through $2 trillion in tax cuts to the same process that we're considering this budget. They ran through uh, a whole host of other elements, uh, including efforts to try to appeal the Affordable Care Act by the same budget process we are. Uh, and when we tried to get them to join us for months under the Affordable Care Act to get uh, Republican buy-in, at the end of the day, after months, they rejected any effort. So I'm all for bipartisanship, but right now, the American people need action. Lastly, Senator, impeachment a necessity in your mind? I, I, I have, a, I have a, a, a constitutional obligation. It's no longer a question. The House decided to file uh, you know, articles of impeachment. The Constitution requires that the Senate sit as jurors and make a judgment. I will obey and follow my constitutional obligation. All right, Senator Bob Menendez, appreciate your time. Thanks for talking with us. Good to be with you. That's all the chat box we have for this week. Our thanks to Senator Bob Menendez and First Lady Tammy Murphy. Join us next week when we examine the terrible economic impact of COVID on women in the workplace. You can follow me on Twitter at David Cruz and Jay. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel for more stuff like our Beyond the Box features, NJ Business Beat, and NJ Spotlight News. I'm David Cruz. For the entire crew over here, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Major funding for Chatbox with David Cruz is provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. The Fuel Merchants Association of New Jersey, the National Oil Heat Research Alliance and BioHeat, the evolution of oil heat. Promotional support is provided by Insider NJ, a political intelligence network dedicated to New Jersey political news. Insider NJ is committed to giving serious political players an interactive forum for ideas, discussion, and insight. Online at insidernj.com.